Welcome to RWJ Barnabas Health's Health Talk Show. I am Dr. Douglas Oshinsky of RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group. According to the American Cancer Society, skin cancer is by far the most common type of cancer. In fact, more people are diagnosed with skin cancer each year in the United States than any other cancer combined. Our skin has many functions, such as protecting our bodies from harmful substances, regulating body temperature, and it allows us to have a sense of touch. Skin cancer develops when there is an abnormal growth of skin cells, and most often develops on skin exposed to sun. On today's show, we will learn more about the different types of skin cancer, latest treatment options, and the importance of prevention. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Sarah Weiss, medical oncologist and director of the Melanoma Program at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Dr. Weiss is also on staff at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Weiss, for being here. And for the studio audience, as well as the uh, audience out uh, in, uh, who are watching us on the TV, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, where you practice, et cetera. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so I am a medical oncologist um, with a focus on management of advanced skin cancers. So I see patients who have melanoma, but also advanced basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas and also Merkel cell carcinomas. Um, I currently practice at CINJ where I'm leading the, the melanoma and cutaneous oncology group. Uh, and that group is made up of not only medical oncologists like myself, but also um, a whole team of uh, people who take care of these patients. So surgical oncology, radiation oncology, dermatologists, um, pathologists, radiologists. So we have a, a whole team uh, that are, you know, taking care of these patients together. So a medical oncologist, so that the audience knows, you're the one who helps direct the treatment of cancer uh, uh, care. Yes. So um, with a lot of cancers and skin cancer certainly included, it's a very multidisciplinary uh, field. So we need uh, input and uh, management by a lot of people that I mentioned kind of on this team. So as a medical oncologist, my training and, and what I do is I uh, give essentially in simple terms medication to either try to reduce the chance of skin cancers coming back or to um, to treat advanced skin cancers that, you know, can't be dealt with by surgery or surgery alone. And more and more in a lot of our skin cancers, um, medications are kind of moving up forward into earlier and earlier stages of cancer. So I don't just see, and, and medical oncologists who treat skin cancer don't just see patients with stage four melanoma or other skin cancers. We actually see people at much earlier stages. Um, and some patients, if we're not giving medications to, you know, we follow them for, uh, they, they remain at risk for the skin cancer coming back. So we also do what we call surveillance. So you, basically, you are the captain of the ship. <laughs> uh, it's definitely a team effort, uh, but but certainly for patients who are on treatment or have advanced disease, um, you know, I think the primary person in that case is the is the medical oncologist. So now that it's summertime, let's talk about skin cancer itself. What are the causes of skin cancer, and what are the most prevalent types of cancer? So, you know, the most, uh, I'll start with the most prevalent types of skin cancer. So a lot of people um, hear about melanoma because that one has sort of the highest propensity to spread and, and unfortunately can be deadly in some cases, but non-melanoma skin cancer, so basal cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, those types of skin cancers are actually quite common. They happen in millions of people each year. Um, and luckily, <clears throat> Those can often be dealt with by uh, you know, seeing a dermatologist, getting a biopsy, and then having an, an excision of those. So non-melanoma skin cancers are really the most common. 
Um, we end up seeing those uh, when they come back or metastasize or spread, which luckily is, is not at all the vast majority of cases. Most can be dealt with uh, by excision, but there are cases that are more advanced. The other skin cancers we see are melanoma, which we see commonly because that often needs treatment or needs advanced um, management. And then there's also a really rare kind of skin cancer called Merkel cell carcinoma, which a lot of people probably haven't heard of, but it's a, it's another skin cancer. It only occurs in, in a few thousand people a year in the US, but we also manage that because that also can spread. Um, so those, those are really the main types of skin cancer. In terms of, you know, what causes skin cancer, the vast majority of cancers, and at least what we know, are caused by UV, UV exposure um, from the sun. From the sun or artificial means if, if people are using tanning beds or sun lamps or things like that. So um, people who are more at risk of getting that, that sunlight and UV penetration are people who have fairer skin, uh, lighter eyes, um, you know, red hair, uh, people who live even geographically like closer to the equator where the sun is stronger. So um, those are all people who are at higher risk of skin cancer. Um, skin cancer is mostly sporadic, meaning it just it tends to arise. It's typically not hereditary or, or a minority of cases are hereditary. But if there is a family history of skin cancer, you know, that's a reason uh, for people to get screened. And then in other cases, um, you know, people who have other medical issues for which they're immunosuppressed are on immunosuppressive drugs, such as people with organ transplants, people who have certain types of, uh, of blood and, and lymph cancers, um, those patients also could be at higher risk of skin cancer development as well. So things to remember are during the summertime, sunblock, suntan lotion, hats, if you can get a hat with some type of uh, protection in the hat, sunglasses, and then also uh, uh, if you are uh, fair skinned, freckles, red hair, B blue eyes and really uh, uh, very, very uh, fair skin. Important to cover up at times. Yes, everyone loves a suntan, but we don't want the sunburn. So it's important that we put on as much protection as possible. And even more important is to remember about reapplying. Exactly. So just all, you know, common sense, safe sun practices are really important. And it starts from when kids are, you know, chil children, right? Babies and, and older, because um, most of the skin cancers that form, it's not like you get a sunburn, you know, last summer and all of a sudden you have a skin cancer. Typically, it's either intermittent damage from the sun over time um, or bad sunburns, you know, when you were a kid that have, have caused sort of damage in the skin that has led to skin cancer. And I think what we don't know and what's I think there are other factors that probably contribute to skin cancers that we don't know about. Um, because if you take two people, right, who have had the same sun exposure, why does one person develop, you know, and maybe the same coloring, why does one person develop skin cancer and the other doesn't? So I think more and more we're trying to learn if there's other susceptibilities. But the, the main preventative measures are definitely, you know, sunblock, covering up. Um, those are all really, really important. Okay, so I'm a primary care doctor and I see people for annual wellness exams. And part of my annual wellness exam is examining their skin and again reminding them about seeing a dermatologist, especially if they're someone who loves the sun. And so I see a mole or I see something on the skin that is questionable. So I send them to a dermatologist. So what happens when they go to the dermatologist and what happens if a skin cancer is diagnosed by a dermatologist? Yeah, so really important for patients whenever they have a concerning finding to get evalu evaluated by a dermatologist. So the dermatologist, you know, they're training, they're going to look at the lesion and they're going to decide, does that look suspicious? Is there a high enough risk that that could be a skin cancer where they're going to biopsy it? If they're not going to biopsy it, they'll certainly follow anything that's suspicious. But if it warrants, you know, a biopsy, they're going to take a sample of it. It's going to be sent to the pathologist who will look at it under the microscope and then based on what they see they'll report you know out what it is and if it's a skin cancer the the ones i mentioned so the a basal cell squamous cell melanoma merkel cell um, one of those might end up being diagnosed so often once the the biopsy is really um, for the purpose of diagnosis often after the biopsy depending on the features and the size of the lesion 
patients will often need um, an excision either by a, a dermatologist who's skilled in that, or often they'll have to be referred to a, a surgical oncologist who specializes in excision. Um, and sometimes, uh, especially for melanoma, if the, if the primary lesion that was biopsied has enough high risk features, sometimes we also have to test the, the lymph nodes that are closest. So um, the dermatologist is often kind of the start of that, and, and that's how it's usually diagnosed. So going to the dermatologist is especially important. Any you need to really be examining yourself constantly, and if you see any changes in any lesion on the skin, even though they call them old age spots, if there's a, you have, think you have old age spots, you should either uh, see a primary care doctor who can refer you to a dermatologist or go directly to the dermatologist who looks at them, looks at the shape, looks at the size of it, looks at in the edges of it. They'll look at it sometimes under the blue light to see if there's any uh, abnormalities. And then the important thing, they make the decision whether they think they should do a scraping or a biopsy biopsy being sent to the pathologist. In a, uh, seven to 10 days, you find out whether or not it's something to be concerned about. That then sets up whether we do something about it, whether we do a large excision, whether we refer them to a Mohs person to do Mohs procedure on them, or whether we send them to a surgical oncologist for something further. That's right. And, um, you know, what a lot of my patients, because I always see the patients right after they've had the diagnosis. So a lot of times they will have taken a photo of the primary lesion and they'll show it to me. And a lot of times I hear from them, wow, you know, that wasn't what I expected or I didn't realize that that was a skin cancer. My dermatologist or my primary care physician just picked that up. Or even sometimes a family member said, you know, hey, you should get that looked at. So, um, so yeah, sometimes it takes multiple eyes to see. And sometimes even the features that we think are, you know, atypical and abnormal can sometimes these skin cancers can present in, in ways you might not expect. So it's always good to, to get screened and make sure you're being followed closely. Are there certain places on the body that people should be looking for? So that's an interesting question because, you know, most, most and many skin cancers will show up in areas that are highly sun exposed. So the head and neck is a very common area, the scalp, uh, even the tips of the ears, you know, the face, the neck, these can all be areas that um, are have a lot of sun damage and sun exposure. So skin cancers can show up there. Also the extremities, because often uh, those are exposed, especially in the summer and, and warmer months. Um, but interestingly, some skin cancers can arise in areas that are non-sun exposed or even in other parts of the body that you wouldn't expect. So for melanoma, for example, not only can it occur in sun exposed areas, there's, a, there's something called an acral melanoma that can occur on the palms of the hand or even the soles of the feet. Um, and melanoma can also start under the fingernails. We call that subungual melanoma. Um, melanoma can also start actually in non-skin areas. So it can start in mucosal linings of the body, even in the sinuses, in the, the oropharynx, um, you know, down in the anorectal area and in the vulvar area. So even in mucosal lining, you know, melanoma can arise. Um, so the most important thing, if there's anything suspicious, you know, or any, any suspicious symptoms, patients should always bring it to the attention of, of their physician for a full evaluation. So they see the dermatologist and the de dermatologist diagnoses a skin cancer. When is, what, what should the person do? Is that the time that we refer them to a medical oncologist or over to the uh, Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey? Yeah, so usually what happens is the patient will first be referred over to our surgical oncologist. And then our surgical oncologist will do an evaluation. They might determine whether or not the patient needs to have initial imaging. Uh, sometimes we worry if they're, if the initial primary, you know, skin cancer, if it appeared aggressive enough, we first kind of do an assessment and see if it's spread anywhere else, if we can see that on, on body imaging with either a PET CT or with CAT scans. And then they get assessed and we speak to them about whether or not surgery is appropriate. Um, interestingly, um, you know, I will often see the patients in conjunction with my colleagues because now more and more we're doing something called neoadjuvant therapy for certain patients who might qualify, who let's say have a tumor, a skin cancer, particularly melanoma, let's say that, that has gone to a lymph node and we can feel it. 
Sometimes what we'll do is we'll give them um, immunotherapy, so medication to try to shrink the tumor first, and then we'll try to shrink it, and then they'll have surgery. Um, other you know, instances, they'll have surgery first, and then a lymph node will be tested, and we'll find out that that's positive for melanoma. At that point, the patients come to see me because at that point, too, we can offer therapies to try to reduce the chance of it coming back. So every patient is sort of a different situation depending on, you know, the pathologic features, the imaging findings, um, and, uh, and we kind of go from there. So often we do see these patients together and, and discuss them as a group. So when a person is diagnosed by a dermatologist, they should really think about uh, being referred over to the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, since you do have the team approach to the uh, cancer treatments. Yeah, what's really nice is that we're sort of all there under one roof and not even under one roof, we're literally sitting next to each other um, in the clinic. So, you know, um, Almost every day of the week, we have a medical oncologist and a surgical oncologist in clinic on the same day. Um, we also have our radiation team who's nearby. We have a dermatologist who's with us. And so we really have, you know, a lot of times our patients can see uh, multiple people in one day and kind of get the opinion and get the treatment plan very quickly, which I think is unique rather than, you know, sometimes being sent to multiple different um, uh, specialists kind of around. This is really nice because we have a cohesive team and we're all kind of, again, it, under the same roof. Well, it's nice because one, they all have the same EMR so they can talk to each other very easily. Two, you're in the same building and as you said, desks next to each other, so communication's very good. Uh, yes. Rather than being sent to one, uh, one physician's office for a biopsy, one physician's office for an oncologist, one physician's office for the plastic surgeon, and then trying to get all three of those to work together, much easier to do it at a place where you have the team approach to it. Exactly. And uh, every week we hold what's called a tumor board um, where we all meet together. Every, you know, all of the specialists on our skin cancer team, we talk about patients either with challenging cases or new patients we have where we're trying to make treatment planning. And because so many of our patients now need what we call multimodality therapy, surgery, um, immunotherapy or targeted therapy, radiation, again, we kind of discuss all of the patients. And so the patients um, have uh, multiple people weighing in from different angles and, and we develop uh, you know, a really cohesive plan. And not only that, but because you are a large institute that does do this, you also have research and therefore clinical trials. Yes, yes. So that's a big part of my practice and, and my interest in general and also of our group. Um, so what's great about the, our Cancer Institute is, you know, we're very focused on research and um, trying to be part of and create, you know, the latest data and, and new techniques and kind of be right there on the cutting edge of things for skin cancer. So we're very focused on clinical trials and our goal and, uh, you know, over time, but, but even now is to try to have a clinical trial for every sort of for every patient along the way in, in the step. So whether it's someone who's just had a melanoma resected where we wanna give medication to reduce the chance of it coming back, for someone who needs frontline treatment, um, meaning they have metastatic disease and they need to, to start with the, the first treatment. And then especially for people who have been given, you know, some of our standard drugs, like various immunotherapies or targeted therapies. And for whatever reason, if their tumors are resistant, we offer clinical trials also for those patients to try to find, um, you know, identify new therapies that might be effective that, that are being developed. So our goal really is to not only just treat patients with sort of what we have and what's known, but to really build on that and give them, you know, give them the opportunity to have like the newest, um, the newest things out there. You have the newest things out there. You have the clinical trials. You have it close by to home. You have social services, family services available also. So as the clinical team, you're getting the best possible care in the your close environment of New Jersey. You don't need to be running all over the country to get the best care possible. That's right. So, you know, New Jersey is a very densely populated state. It's situated, uh, you know, in a tri-state area where there's a number of, you know, excellent um, medical facilities and hospitals and uh, cancer expertise. But the really good news is <laughs> in, in everyone's backyard in New Jersey, you really don't have to travel far. 
Um, especially, you know, for many of our cancer types, but especially for skin cancer, you know, we're very lucky. We have a very comprehensive team. We have clinical trials. We have sort of everything you need in one place. Um, and we try to make it as easy for our patients as possible. So I think there's, there's really, really a lot of benefits to coming to kind of, again, one site, uh, one electronic medical record um, where everyone is, is kind of putting their heads together at, at one time. So after uh, they come through uh, the uh, Rutgers Cancer uh, Institute of New Jersey, they've had their treatment. What is the follow-up after that? So the follow-up, you know, is, is very dependent based on, um, uh, you know, the stage of the skin cancer. And uh, we try to really individualize it for each, each patient. Typically, for example, for melanoma, um, people who have melanoma that's been fully resected, we will often offer them treatment with either immunotherapy or something called targeted therapy or a clinical trial to try to give them medication to reduce the chance of the melanoma coming back. So typically we treat those people for a year, but then uh, based on their risk, and again, that's based on the, the pathology and what came out of their surgery and how many lymph nodes they had positive, uh, we tend to follow those patients for a minimum of about five years. So they still continue to see us even when they're not on treatment. Um, we monitor them for recurrence. They get physical exams. They get imaging at least every six months. And we do that for at least a period of five years because we know that the, the highest chance for recurrence comes um, in the first few years after patients have had their primary treatment. Um, it can come back even later than that, but you know we tend to, to focus on that time period. For people who have metastatic uh, melanoma, so stage four, and certainly anyone else with more advanced or, or stage four other types of skin cancer, those patients we have really long-term follow-up on. Um, the good news is that some of our patients, um, their tumors can be highly responsive to immunotherapies that we have. And so even in my practice, and, and you know we've known this for a while, there, for whatever reason, some people who have advanced melanoma can have really significant responses to immunotherapy to the point where their tumor will shrink or even completely disappear. Um, and that, that usually takes a little bit of time, but there are people who can actually come off of treatment and go on living their lives and essentially are, are you know, in remission. So that's certainly not the majority of patients, but that is a, a small percentage of patients and that, that gives us a lot of hope. So those patients are certainly followed still um, after therapy, um, because again, if something comes back, there's many things we can do for skin cancer, even if they've already had the primary treatments, we can offer clinical trials or, you know, in, in oncology in general, there's always new, um, new things coming out. So, so, so we really keep an eye on our patients. We follow them closely. And then for people who are on treatment, those are people we're seeing every few weeks um, who are receiving their treatment, who are monitoring, who are helping manage, you know, side effects and who, if, you know, they're not responding to treatment um, and we're trying to learn more about why, why certain tumors do not respond, but those people, you know, then we work on finding them clinical trials if they don't have other options. Now you had mentioned Merkel cell. What is Merkel cell? So Merkel cell is a, a type of what's called a neuroendocrine tumor. So it does occur on the skin and it often will present as sort of like a little, um, a little, almost a pimple is how I might describe it. Um, again, it's very rare. So a lot of people have never heard of it. Even a lot of physicians have actually never heard of it. It occurs probably in about 3,000 people a year in the United States, mostly in older individuals. So people um, maybe in their 70s, uh, more elderly population, um, people who have had sun exposure, um, you know, significant sun exposure. It is one of the viral associated cancers. So um, some of the Merkel cell carcinomas are associated with a virus called polyoma virus. It's nothing that, you know, someone should be necessarily tested for or anything previously, but um, there are other types of viral associated cancers as well, you know, such as cervical cancer. So the Merkel cell is actually one of those. Um, Merkel cell is handled similar to the other types of skin cancer. So it's, you know, a, a patient notes it, um, it's, it's biopsied by a dermatologist. We excise it and we do test um, depending on the features for the, the sentinel lymph node um, to see if that's involved. And then based on that, patients are either followed or if the node is positive, 
you know, again, we tend to do both therapy with immunotherapy um, and patients get surgery. And Merkel cell, unfortunately, can be highly aggressive. So we follow these patients really closely for recurrence and for met metastatic disease. You know, we image them um, frequently. Um, and luckily, uh, we've seen a lot of progress also with treating these patients with immunotherapy. But again, that it, it really is an area where if immunotherapy isn't working, you know, we're trying to, to identify new strategies for those patients. So what do you really think distinguishes RWJ, Barnabas Health, Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey from other centers that when treating skin cancer? So I think, it, you know, I think it's a lot of what we already mentioned. I mean, you know, patients have a lot of options about where to go. And I think they have to feel comfortable, you know, where they are um, and who they're seeing. And I think our team is unique in that um, again, we all, we know each other, we all talk to each other, we share the same patients, we often will see the patients on the same day. Um, we're very committed to getting patients in as soon as possible, because, you know, unlike other certain medical issues that maybe you can wait a little bit, you really can't wait with, with cancer. So um, it's very important to us that patients are seen, you know, right away as soon as we hear about them and we make every effort to get them in. Um, we, you know, we have a full uh, infusion center on site. So patients see me the same day that they get their treatment. Uh, we have a huge new cancer center facility that's currently being built and hopefully will be open uh, at the end of next year. So that's going to have just, uh, it's going to be a beautiful building, you know, full services. It's going to, you know, we, we are really expanding where we currently are. Um, which is a good thing, uh, and we're going to be able to offer even more services and more space to to all of our patients. So I think I think that's one uh, positive, and I think the other positive again really is we're able to offer clinical trials, and we're trying to not just do kind of what's always been done. We're trying to push things along. Um, we're very interested in in getting patients the opportunity to have you know the what kind of what the next best thing is. Um, or to have the opportunity to, to, to test it and see um, all clinical trials, you know, because I think sometimes people have misconceptions about them. We're always treating patients with what the standard is. <clears throat> They're always getting a treatment, essentially, for people who have active disease. Um, it's just that sometimes we add something to that standard therapy, or we're giving something that has a lot of scientific rationale that could really help them. So we're always trying to do the standard plus, uh, plus something additional for patients. Um, and yeah, I think those are, and again, just location. I mean, people don't have to travel to New York or Philadelphia or even farther. There's really, um, really a lot that, that we offer. I think that is essentially similar to other um, institutions of our size or even larger. So we, we are very happy to, um, to help everyone in New Jersey and not just not just in our state, but anyone who's nearby and wants to come. So as we wrap up, things to remember is one, try to reduce your risk factors for skin cancer. Two, any questions, see your doctor, see a dermatologist, let them take a look. Three is if the dermatologist uh, thinks that the uh, that there is he, he does a pathology and it is a cancer. Really, we should think about going uh, for an evaluation at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, since it is the team approach to uh, cancer and has uh, uh, basically gives us the best possible treatment, the best possible clinical trials, and the best possible physicians uh, for the treatment. Thank you, Dr. Weiss, for being here. Thank you for Thank all you. of your information. And uh, thank you for everything that you do to help uh, fight skin cancer. Thank you. That concludes today's episode of Health Talk. Please remember that the opinions expressed here today by our medical expert are not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. If you need a physician, please call 844-CANCER-NJ. That's C-A-N-C-E-R-N-J. For more information about skin cancer treatment at RWJ Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, please visit us at www.rwjbh.org forward slash cancer.